The, the title of this course is, um, Look, You've Got It All Wrong, which is a quote from my favorite scene from the uh, Monty Python films, where he, he goes out and says, look, you've got it all wrong. You don't need to follow me. You don't need to follow anyone. You're all individuals. I think you all know this by now. And what it really is, is a chance at the end of um, Eric's term as director to fix all the mistakes he made in four, <laughs> four pedagogical mistakes he made. It's actually to go back and look at the period of his time, which I think of personally, and I'm speaking only personally, as the most interesting and personally profoundly moving directorship I've ever seen at a university, and I've been involved in many of them. And it's been so because of an incredible match of a personal philosophy an attitude about architecture with an ethos of a school. And so we wanted to get a, make a record of this, and we wanted to make a record of this in terms, you know, as a kind of way of concluding for the school. And it was, it's going to go into a book also with some reflections on the faculty on the same topic. And we also thought it was an important course. So we would like you to take it, think of it as a course. And the reason we, call, we entitled that, we want to go back and look at some of the issues that he brought, he brings to bear, because he will continue to bring these to bear in his own work as an architecture and as a teacher. Uh, it made us think about as rethink, I don't know what the word would be, uh, what, what, what are some of the standards or what are some of the received wisdoms that he has made us challenge at the level of how an institution is formed and how work is done um, and I thought it was really important for us to start today with the issue of the pleasure of building. And why we call this, look, you've got it all wrong, is that there is a tendency in the School of Architecture at SciArc um, not to take cognizance of the problem of building in a certain way. And. Uh, I want you to understand this has got nothing to do with the fact that you are, as a, as a representative of a collective, the most gifted, driven group of makers I know as a student body. To walk into an undergraduate thesis or to walk into a graduate thesis is to face an intimidating body of production that not only makes every architecture student envy in the world, where they come from the AA, where they come from schools that have that reputation beforehand, Cooper or the AA or otherwise, but if even if they come from art schools, just to see it on the walls is to see a startling ethos of what it is to engage with matter from the level of an idea. But what's missing is therefore, it's not a question of just making. It's a question of understanding the pleasures of working at a different scale. You know, that seems like for you, or at least we've seems like we've conveyed the issue that that's somehow a problem to be solved, not a pleasure in itself. What it means to go from an idea to a model and a drawing, and then the next step into a building somehow doesn't seem to you even more fun. It seems even more challenging, even more expensive, even more dangerous, even more likely to get sued, even more likely to get fired. It has all kinds of even more likelies to it. But it doesn't seem to you even more fun. And so that's where we, the idea that Eric and I, I came up with, uh, look, you got it all wrong. And that's what we wanted to start with first. And so really that's what this session is about. So I had a few cases to show you. Um, the two, I think there's three, I'm just gonna briefly touch on the three. My, my computer is somewhere with the rest of my clothes. Uh, not the airline's fault, but my fault for leaving one in one stop and one in another stop. It was just, uh, and I've stopped drinking, so I, it's very hard to explain these things. Um, uh, the first one I think is, is, has to be everybody's story, favorite story. It has to be your favorite story. You should look it up online. I want you to go to PBS online, look at Nova, and look at a story called uh, The Secret of the Great Cathedral. 
It's, a, it's really the story of Brunelleschi's Cathedral. You have to know it. You have to love it. It is the most fantastic story in the history of architecture. It's a story of a guy who never built anything whatsoever. Nothing, period. He was a goldsmith who figured out how to build a building that no one has figured out how he built it until finally they figured out the last secret about 20 years ago. And so it's the Brunelleschi's Dome. It has two great secrets. One it has to do with the brick he invented, which is called the bearing bone brick pattern. Uh, it turns out that it looks like it has eight walls. And, and the problem is this, how do, you, how do you span an arch that tall? The reason they couldn't build it uh, in a traditional fashion is to cut, is to support that much arch with a traditional method of building a wood frame and then put it, laying the bricks on it and pulling the frame out. It would have cost way too much and it would have taken too much timber. It would have taken too long, cost too much. Very familiar. So he had to figure out a way to build a freestanding arch without a wood frame, and they didn't know how to use the concrete. Uh, they'd forgot, they'd lost the methods of the concrete pouring methods to use at the Pantheon. So they had a contest, he claimed he knew how to do it. He didn't want to tell anybody else how to do it. Like all great architects, he had a secret, he thought he had a secret to do it, and so he, they gave him a chance, they talked him into it. And how, he did have a secret, the secret was to use this brick pattern, and the brick pattern basically stopped the problem of the build, of the of the dome collapsing in on itself at the weakness of the mortar by introducing a cross brick. You'll, you'll watch this. It's fantastic. It's, the, it's uplifting. It's a magic trick whose conclusion never comes. It's, a, it's sawing the woman in half and you don't know if she's dead or alive because you never see her again. It's the most fantastic thing you've ever seen. But there's two parts to it. One, and they didn't know this, but the brick pattern itself not only stops the mortar from falling, but it creates a single wall because it turns out that it makes a spiral in the structure. So instead of eight separate walls, it unites the walls. It knits them together in one gigantic wall. But here is the magic trick of all times. There are 40,000 tons of bricks, over 300, uh, over 700,000, almost three quarters of a million bricks. Guys hanging down them, having to hang them, trusting their lives like this guy who's never built a fucking thing. Okay. All of them are going to be built in seven years. At the very end, all eight bricks have to meet exactly right. No deviations of inches, none. How do you get that to happen? That was the magic trick of all time. And no one knew how he did it. No one figured out how he did it. They finally figured it out about 15 years ago when they discovered a drawing. And what he did, there's a thing called the work platform. And you draw a work platform. And the way you lay bricks in this situation, you still use them today, is you, draw, you throw strings. You draw strings. And the strings have to go through a center point. And once they go through the center point, you guarantee that the next brick you lined up do that. In order to get these things to match exactly, he drew a pattern, but the pattern had a secret line in it. It was called a flora. Little bitty, so you look at the line, you see a circle, because it's a round dome. You see an octagon, which you expect because there's eight walls. But what you don't realize you see, and it took a long time to find this in, a, in one document, there's an eight art little flower, named because it's the, what's the name of the church? You know this. You're not the student. Come on, man. You're co-teaching this damn class. Okay. So, uh, of the flower. Florence is a flower. So this is, he drew a flower. And this flower gives him an unusual string pattern. And the string pattern makes the bricks behave in a certain way, guarantees they line up on this exactly. So it's a fantastic, it's the greatest construction story of all time, it's, it's the greatest story. It's where you begin to fall in love with architecture. Anyway, it continues, my, the presentation would continue on a little bit into Leonardo. Leonardo, some of you that are in my studio know, is my favorite person because he's the first postmodern man. ADHD, dyslexia, homosexual, constantly in trouble, bought, just like you, more than 2,000 books, never finished a single one, okay? 
uh, 8,000 architectural ideas, almost all of them ridiculous. Ideas about how to walk on water. But the first thing he did whenever he thought of anything, no matter how ridiculous it was, was how to make it happen. And almost all of those ideas were ridiculous. To walk on water, you put a balloon on two feet, you, and you take two sticks, and you put balloons on the two sticks, and then you walk on water. To make a gigantic painting that looked realistic in a, in a church, you mix oil and water, and you paint real fast. So he was a, but he was also the first theorist, architect, who ever tried to work out the theory of the strength of a column in abstract. In other words, not in a particular circumstance. So he was obsessed with architectural ideas. He only built three works of architecture and 8,000 architectural ideas. He designed whole cities. He designed automatic palaces for cleaning horses, eight, you know, for hundreds of horses that would go in, get fed, get clean, get groomed automatically. But the first thing he drew was how he thought it might work. And so it goes on and on and on. Harry Cobb at the Boston, you know, you, most of the things you know are gigantic failures, buildings that fall down, things that fall down. What you don't also know, though, is uh, lots of times buildings get rebuilt or get redone, like the Harry Cobb Tower, like works by Philip Johnson, and, and they either get improved or they get made, redone to made cheaply, and a very small change in the detailing dramatically changes the way it looks. So I had pictures of Philip Johnson's buildings in, in Houston, architects you may or may not like. They, got resurfaced, or when Harry Cobb's building it in, in Boston fell down, the new system they put on. If you see the before and after, you never see the before and after in life, because all you see is the after and the after. You think, okay, they did a pretty good job, it looks pretty much the same. But if you see the before and after, if you see the change in the system, it's night and day. It's like changing the key of a piece of music for a composer it makes the biggest difference in the world. So it goes from big to small, and their stories are endless and endless and endless, and the pleasures are fantastic. And they can be so fantastic that you can start doing them just for the fun of it. So the thing I wanted to line up against Brunelleschi's brickwork, and I'm sorry, Eric, because I keep calling it the Spider-Man mask. What's the name of the window? It, the thousand brick window at, in Culver City? What's the name of that little project? You name all your projects. Trivia. Trivia? Trivia. Tri oh, oh, I, I thought I had. Oh, I thought you had. I thought I had a nickname like. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, so he, you know, the one I'm talking about. There's this brick window that looks like Spider-Man sticking his head out the window, <laughs> and you know he, it's got about a thousand bricks. I can't really remember exact number, but. He's, he's drawn, drawn the position, the, the geometric position. You, know, you may know these drawings. That there's an obsessive number of drawings of each of the bricks for totally ridiculous, almost self-indulgent reasons to understand the geometry of that brick laying way beyond the necessity for its construction. So just the, just the engagement of it itself can turn into a pleasure. And Every architect I know, I don't know if you remember these arguments between Tom Main and Eric about where the screw, how the screw should be lined up. Every architect, you know, and I, I had a little video of Tom and Main arguing about screws lined up, and then I had another video of the astronauts training for nine months about just how to screw the Hubble back together. They had to train with a special jig because to actually take the screw out of a Hubble and put it back in was one of the hardest mechanical things. And here are Eric and, uh, and Tom lining up, worrying about the aesthetics of a screw lined up. So it's a really fantastic thing. And, we, and to, if we could leave a legacy on the way to a next uh, generation of architecture that can't wait to get involved in this problem, then this would be a fantastic uh, goal of this session. And let me introduce you to Eric. And thank you for waiting again. You can stay here. Okay. Yeah. Nice job. Yeah. Nice to see all of you. Um, I don't remember actually being part of the origins of the title of the seminar, meaning the pleasure of building. I think, I think that belongs to Jeff, and I'm 
happy to respond to it. And I was thinking about what he was what he was saying, and and I'm of several minds, and maybe I can make sense out of all of this, and maybe I can't. Um, I've never been able to articulate, and maybe you people have this issue too, exactly what pushes me to do what I do, and exactly why <laughs> it's, it's a necessity which belongs more to survival than it does to a particular profession or discipline or even an area of interest. And when you think about pleasure and the pleasure of them, in a lot of ways, if, if somebody asked all of you, what do you mean the pleasure of building? And it was the way Jeff was explaining the kind of, the kind of exhilaration or energy or rush, or even when you're down and you come back, a resilience, but it's not an intellectual resilience, it's an emotional resilience. That, that has to do, I think, to some extent with putting things in, in front of you, maybe I shouldn't say you, in front of me, which are intrinsically inscrutable, which means in a certain way to set up problems to which the solutions, if there are solutions, aren't clear or maybe aren't known. And I think the, the, if I tried to intellectualize this or roll out an explanation that I could write down and someone could read, I think it has something to do with the fact that, that we live in, or some of us live in, or maybe you live in, what would be considered to be a progressivist world a deductive world, an analytical world, a world where problems are amenable to solutions and to analysis and thinking. You know, the guy said, I think, and therefore I am. And I think that's always been, a, notwithstanding the fact that I tend probably to overthink almost everything, that, that I'm very cognizant of the limits of that process, that the most fundamental things that I've dealt with and issues in my life don't seem to be amenable to a kind of rational, analytical, deductive analysis and explanation. And so that I think my sense of architecture has, has very much to do, and this is a personal issue, whether it's, whether it's extended to any of you, I don't know, maybe a few, was to set things in front of myself, and I'm not sure I did this consciously, or at least not initially, that were symptomatic of the problem of living as I understood it which is that, that there's more unknown than there is known. And it'll always be that way. It won't be that we're catching up, and it won't be that we'll come to understand, and it won't be, although to make a building is to hypothesize a solution and then to move toward it. And then the question is, once you've done that, what do you do the next time? Do you redo it? Do you rerun it? Do you think, and you can see this with a number of architects at a certain point, I didn't know, I'm trying to know, I have a hypothesis, it's fragile, now I know, and I'll continue to do what I know. And, and uh, years ago, when, when I think we did the first book with, with Rizzoli, we had something, there were, there were a group of theories that I had, and it's, it's uh, of some use to me to come back and, and to look at those again. And one of them was called the Penelope theory of architecture. And Penelope was Odysseus' wife, and Odysseus was gone for 10 years to fight the Trojans, and then he was gone for 10 years wandering around the Mediterranean. 
And so a lot of characters showed up at Odysseus' house in Ithaca and wanted to marry his wife. And she said at one point, okay, I'll pick one of you jokers. As soon as I knit a shroud, shroud for the father of Odysseus, whose name was Laertes. And what she did was, was she had a loom and she worked on the loom and they could see her working during the day. And then at night, she, of course, undid what she did the previous day. So she made it and she unmade it. And, and very early in the discussion for me, that, that process of putting something together as a hypothesis, even aggressively and confidently, and with the expectation that this was the way to do it, and then simultaneously being skeptical of it and suspicious of it and knowing that it might go somewhere else. And I think it, it, so this is where that theory comes from. And I still feel very much that way that you make it and you unmake it. And that's part of the process of going forward. So when you look at, when you look at a sequence of projects, and I'll talk a little bit about, we're, we're doing a, a big book now for, for Rizzoli, and the book is called I'll See It When I Believe It. And, and it, it, with, with Rizzoli and, and, and with the AACDU in, in Beijing, but the essence of it has to do with if I can imagine doing it and it's so, it'll come to life. It has no life, I can bring it to life. And then according to my hypothesis, it would go away and then we'd bring another life to bear. So let me go through a couple uh, images with you. And, and uh, some of these I've shared with Jeff in the past and uh, try to see if I can um, make not so much a case, but but a series of points which don't necessarily form a constellation, or if they do, it might be better for you to draw the constellation than for me. But they're reference points um, that have something to do, I think, with, with how I deal with this process of doing architecture. To go back for a minute to the pleasure of, of doing this, um, if pleasure is you're out on a yacht with a cognac and your girlfriend, you know, that kind of thing, that might be pleasure in a certain context. There are a lot of definitions of that. I, I, don't, I don't mean that kind of pleasure, but there, there is something endemic to being alive that has to do with digging into what you can't finally uncover or discover and working on it and moving it and responding to it in various ways. And I think what you'll see is there, there are issues of conceptualization that, that present particular kinds of problems. And then there are issues, Jeff referred to this question of, of, of I think what he called making it real or realizing or implementing, which are different kinds of problems which have in some cases to do with dancing through circumstances that weren't anticipated. And you can actually set up a project so that you run smack into those things. And sometimes we've done that. This is an image from uh, the one that's in front of you from 1967, uh, a slide that I took in Berkeley, and, and this has to do, and, and you, can, you might see the same thing going on in Hong Kong today, if, you, if you're looking at what's going on in Hong Kong, which is quite fascinating. So these processes in one form, you know, you can, you can give bank accounts and Maseratis and Prada shoes and, and free enterprise to almost everybody in China, but it'll always crack. And, and the instinct for what I would call, because I don't have a better word, freedom, freedom comes out of the cracks. It's coming out of the, came out of the cracks in Berkeley, however it got perverted. It's coming out of the cracks in Hong Kong today. Did you see, you know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah, there's a huge, it, it's not quite Tiananmen Square, but it's something like that. Don't tell us who to vote for. Don't tell us how we can vote. We want to do this. Whether they kill it or not, I don't know. But it's important to understand you can't cover the earth with concrete. It'll crack. And I think I'll come out of the cracks, and maybe some of you too. So anyway, this is, a, this is an example of that in Berkeley many years ago. And I think I was at a point in my life, early 20s, and I think I would have liked to have found an affiliation or an allegiance or something that I could be part of and join. I'm one of these or I'm one of those. And I couldn't. And I watched the process of argument, particularly collective argument, in crowds. And the bigger the crowd and the noisier the voice, the less the individuality of the people, their nuances, their opinions, or even their ability to formulate opinions and point of views, points of view, seem to be crushed by numbers by the numbers of people. That's why you've heard me say in the past that, that I like to think of the school one architect at a time, one student at a time. That's what it means to me because in a fundamental way, life is personal. I'm not sure it's exchangeable or transferable, which means arguably this whole thing could be attacked as bogus. What you can teach and what you can't about architecture, so this would be a subject from another discussion, for another discussion. This is, um, uh, Le Corbusier put out a, a book a number of years ago, some of you may know, and it's called Creation as a Patient Search. And Zeus had a number of, of sons, as you may know, uh, and two of them were Dionysus and Apollo. So Le Corbusier made a drawing which is a kind of equitable, bilaterally symmetrical drawing like this. And Dionysus and Apollo, and the Apollonian argument in an intellectual way is reason and logic and deduction and clarity, a kind of equilibrium. And Dionysus is the other, is the other side, if there are sides. And, and was instinct and what was not rational uh, in, in human behavior and history. So he made a drawing and the two, the two pieces were, were uh, balanced equitably. So a number of years ago, I redid the drawing and flipped it so that the, the premise is, and I think this, ratifies, at least in the language of this, this drawing, what I was saying before, that what we're sitting in is enigmatic or inscrutable, instinctive, and Dionysus, and Dionysus is, is, is the, the head of the sun, a tiny piece which more belongs to what we need than what there is. So this was my revised version of the inequities. Now, uh, this, this building um, is as interesting in its own way as uh, Santa Maria della Fiore. And I shot this a number of years ago. I used to go down to the Yucatan. And, I, and uh, so this is in, in northeastern uh, Mexico, and it belongs apparently to the Mayans. I, I have an enormous fascination with things that are nominally old, Angkor Wat and Stonehenge and, and, and all of that, um, that have outlived what was apparently their operational purposes uh, and belong to a different world. And we, in many cases, try to fit our understanding of what people are into an interpretation of what the uses of those projects might be. So anyway, if you, go, if you go to the Yucatan and you look at the Mayan stuff, by and large, the sections, the plans, the building systems are consistent as hell. They're consistent, they're predictable. And 
all of a sudden you come to this building in Chichen Itza, which has a dome. Nothing has a dome. This has a dome. It has a helical section. Nothing has a, sec a helical section. It has a round plan. Nothing has a round plan. And there are, there are explanations related to this and to Venus and to astro-religiosity and so on and so on. But it's striking, actually, and it had a particular appeal to me as a complete anomaly, a complete anomaly in a context where building over hundreds and hundreds of years were, was systematized. Um, this guy I bumped into in 1972 at, at Harvard. He came to speak in Memorial Hall. And uh, the professors, and particularly in, in physics and astronomy and the sciences, told the students, don't go, don't listen to this guy. You can look at his work and you can make your own decisions. But if you look at, I'm not going to read all of this. Uh, you may get to it, you may not. But at the end of the first paragraph in the, in the small type, um, there's, there's a line that the man, a being of erect stature, th thinks himself the prince of creation, felt this long before he, by his own efforts, came to know how to fly in wings of metal around the globe. Man's knowledge now nearly complete are only a few more steps necessary. And the argument is, in perpetuity, most of what surrounds us not only physiologically, but in terms of human behavior, we don't know and can't. Um, this is a drawing for a project that, that was done in, in uh, Vienna a couple of years ago um, called Birds on a Wire. And I think it's the, the way the work that, that, that I do and is done out of my office originates in many cases has to do with, with a, a sort of epiphany or an instinct that relates back to the topics that I was talking about. So the building wasn't a bird and there wasn't a wire and you probably can't find the bird or the wire if you look uh, in the context, in, in, in the particulars of the building. But it had something to do with both the fragility of the bird and the movement of the bird and the fragility of the wire. <clears throat> this, is, this is a sketch by Eric Mendelssohn, who was an architect in the first half of the, of the 20th century, um, drawing very tiny but very precise sketches, be very beautiful sketches, in the trenches of Verdun while uh, shells were exploding around him. And I, this, is, this is a process in terms of how to make things or how to realize that, that, that interests me a lot. What you see below it is the Einstein Tower in Potsdam. And I think what, what really moves architecture is not so much drawing in a way that you know how. I think it has more to do with imagining what you don't know and trying to see if you can produce it or not. In other words, is there a way to draw it? And the way that you draw it is also related to a sense of how it would be implemented. So Mendelssohn cheated on this thing. He didn't really know how to build it. There, were not, there was not a good way to draw it. Parallel rule, scale, uh, triangles. Uh, don't really avail themselves of the kind of curvilinear uh, work that he was dealing with. So they threw a lot of bricks together, they made a pile of bricks, and they wrapped it with plaster. And I think for me, that process, so he built the outside, which is a replica, in a sense, of the sketch, but the understanding as Jeff mentioned, in the Brunelleschi sense of how to put pieces together with, with a kind of precision that allows you to say, this will work and this won't. And he cheated here because piling things up and wrapping them with plaster doesn't really pass for understanding. This is the project Trevita, or at least doesn't pass for me. That's how he did it. That's what he could do. 
this was the the project that that was done i don't know maybe uh 15 18 years ago um and it it contains in it a number of contradictions a number of oppositions questions of of uncertainty issues of how could we do this issues of how could we do this related to how we could draw this if you look at this little model you see it's yellow so the model is yellow so when when we were working on this in the office somebody was drinking tea and they had a lemon they were squeezing a lemon and so to make the model i remember just sticking the lemon into the model so the model was made out of see, the willingness to do that, notwithstanding previous sketches. In other words, to pick something up that didn't belong to the lexicon of, of possible tools, it stuck the lemon up and, and, and pushed it into the wall, which began to make the shape of this happens to be a thousand, a thousand blocks. But then there's another point. So this, you guys have to figure out how to do this. Once you do this, so this is a shape or even a space, depending on how it, how it replicates itself or doesn't on the inside. But the next step has something to do with the decision of how to make it. So to make a lemon, out of concrete blocks is is fundamentally a contradiction. What is a concrete block? You know what a concrete block is. You see them all the time. It's an orthogonal system. It's a block eight by eight by eight, eight by eight by sixteen in the American system. Uh, different countries have different blocks, and they're perforated. So you drop in concrete, and you drop in rebar, and you put them together, and you make boxes, or you make orthogonal pieces in plan, and then you put some kind of roof on, which is not. <clears throat> which is not block. So, to begin with, there's a lemon. How are you going to build it? What are you going to make it out of? And to make it out of an orthogonal piece already, let's say, flies in the face of the sense of the lemon, which is curvilinear. That's intrinsic to the properties of that broken of lemon. So to make it out of, of increments which don't reiterate the curve, so that already sets a problem for us, so that the next step in the development of the curve is to use a straight line which is or is not asymptotic to or analogous to, but never identical with the first shape. So there's a shape and then there's a how are we going to build it response. And the response is to take a material, and you can see it's used on the roof, which you also don't do with a compressive material typically. So it's used, so it's used in a, as a horizontal surface as well as a vertical surface. It's used in contradiction to what is assumed to be the essential nature of a block. Um, and th th there are lots and lots of these drawings. One of the things that, that we did was, was to build an analog or a scaffold. And, and interestingly enough, and maybe a failing of the process, is that the position from which it departs to make the scaffold, and you can see the X members and the Y members, and you can read it, there's a center line so on and so on, um, is a four inch grid. And the question is to what extent, so this is, this is a form, an analog, against which the wall of Trevita will be constructed. And this was in the era where, where, the, where the use, the digital tools, and use of the digital tools was coming along, but we weren't yet in a position to, to introduce that in this project. And I would say, and this is another point to be aware of, when you do something, when you do it, makes an enormous difference. And for this reason, if you did this today, or bent glass today, when you can, when you can use software to do this, or when you can buy bent glass, is different from advancing on a problem where the means to draw it and to implement it aren't available. 
So the task, aside from inventing the, the initiative, is to find a way to do it, and nobody knows how to do it. So they'll say all of the things that Jeff said. It'll leak, it'll fall down, you won't be able to pay for it, and you'll get sued. And that's happened to us um, on occasion. But it doesn't deter anybody. And what's, what's also of interest to me in this, in this uh, discussion of evolving invented processes, none of which anybody had to do. Nobody had to do it this way. The client didn't say do it this way. So we decided, and the client agreed, to make this issue for ourselves. For, for any number of reasons that, that seem to be valid in terms of the process that I understand as the process of, of practicing architecture. Wait, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. When you say nobody, could you have brought a little model and had a masonry and say, imitate this to your best of your ability? When you say nobody had to do it this way, you're saying someone else could have done it? Mm, no, and I, maybe what I said wasn't clear. The solution isn't obligatory. I mean, there's a space, there are offices, there are conference rooms. If you walked all the way to the back of this thing in an existing building, it, it doesn't look so different from what Richard would do, right. except for the front. And the front was a presence of the building on the street, on a wall, and so on and so on. I'm just saying that the sol solution and the problems that were attendant on the solution belong very much to us. So they originated with us. The client concurred. But to build uh, it, this at all required what you did. Yeah, it did. Okay. It did. But I, I was talking about yeah, the, the initiative to the, to the lemon right. and then from the lemon to the block. And those steps, I mean, you could have made this probably out of sticks and plaster. Mm -hmm. You could have made it out of aluminum panels. You probably could have woven it out of bamboo. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do the thing. So what, what I'm really talking about is an, is an approach to these things. And by the way, if you look at the window frames, which you can see in the drawings here. So once you make the wall, it's a lemon. The wall is the lemon. And what, what follows from that is the block. And what follows from the block is now you got to put a window in this thing. But there's, in fact, you got to put six of them in or three of them in. But there is no window that fits in that context. So the window frame, the steel frame, and the glass, which is folded, then comes as a consequence of what was done with the block. So you can see the glass was creased or the glass was folded in order to accommodate the discipline, and it's now a discipline of the block. So anyway, this is how you can see we craned this thing in there. It's, it, what's, what you should know is there's no building built never ever, which is what's drawn. What you draw isn't what gets built. Now, there's, there, you, could, you could argue that it is a precise approximation it's close, it's further. What we were doing here was setting up an, what we're setting up is a scaffold which allows us to put the blocks together. And as we put the blocks together, we're learning how to put the blocks together. So that for all the drawings we made, there's not a single drawing that accurately represents the way this thing was built. So we had a form, and you can, you can see these guys, you can see the rebar, there, there's, there are pipes, the structural pipes, that so you can see the pipe running through there. Um, and the blocks then assembled. There's something a little bit crude about it. I don't, I don't, the kind of precision, the precision and, and, and crude don't seem to go together. And yet, I, I, I think there's a relationship of trying to piece something together. It's like, you know, you're a kid and you get a puzzle, and it's a puzzle of the United States. So you already know, ipso facto, where the states goes and the, uh, go, and that the perimeter of the puzzle will be orthogonal and all of that stuff. This is like putting a puzzle together 
that has never been put together before. So that's a little bit different because you don't know when you get to the end, except in a rough way, that it'll conform to the idea or to the ideal that you started with. So anyway, uh, we put it together. This is the interior, that open area. You know, crude yeah. and precision. Uh, when Alejandro and Farshi were building Yokohama, in order to get the welding inside the triangulation done of the structure, they did. They really didn't know what to do. They had to hire a team of expert midget welders from the Philippines. And, like, and if you believe that, I got it, this no. bridge. So for, I'm telling you, for for a year at every conference they would go to, they would with incredible thrills show pictures of these. This one team of expert midget welders uh, was the only possible way to get it done. It's now done by robots. So I was, I was telling you about this, you know, so. Well, but that in itself is, is of particular interest. So now the robots can do it. So maybe it doesn't count in the That's same right. way. It's not the same. Because, you know. because to pioneer it or to, or to deal with a topic that, that hasn't yet been dealt with is different than dealing with it again. And if we were to build this again, it would have a very different meaning. I think that's where changes take place in the content of architecture, not that it makes it better or worse. And I could give you some other examples of, of, of imagining what one doesn't know how to follow through on. And then the search is, is, is to determine or to locate a way of actually doing that. And that's where invention comes in architecture. I don't think it comes in repeating itself. So this is, this is uh, a more recent project, although it, its history goes back through a number of renditions. And this is an early model of, of something that's now called the waffle. And uh, not for reasons of equivocation. But again, you, you have something which is a form solution as a shape but it doesn't tell you it doesn't tell you how this shape would be delivered as a piece of architecture in other words this is a step and you could debate this step and we could debate that this is a step which now translates the curvature into horizontal we actually tried to do we tried to do this a number of ways we tried to do it all in glass and couldn't pay for it, couldn't come close. But the, but the translation, by the way, I should say that, that um, the plan, this is an infinite pile of plans. So, so the building is not only what it's about as a shape or as an elevation, but every plan infinitely, and there is an infinite number, is a square. So at every moment when a horizontal section is taken through the building, it is a square. You like that? Or not? I don't know. Does it have I infinite like square feet? Huh? Does it have infinite square feet? Sounds good for the developer. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know what they're going to put in this goddamn thing? <laughs> it's funny. It didn't, this wasn't the original plan. It was supposed to be a conference center. They're putting in, and it looks like they're going to do it, the most high-end restaurant on the planet. <laughs> and and uh, it's like a thousand bucks a dinner. It was anticipated that at one point, if it were a restaurant, that it would serve the people in the neighborhood. This is this is a high-end restaurant. We're building a few other pieces around it. Um, that wasn't anticipated initially, but anyway, you go back to so this is an, this is an, an infinite pile of squares, and twisted in a particular way, and the translation of that are a series of vertical and horizontal lines, and as the curve steepens, the horizontal lines approach each other more. So as the curve is more is is sharper, the dimension between the horizontal lines is, is less and less and less, and you can read that um, in, in the surface of the model. And then the column on the inside replicates with straight lines, so the column on the inside follows the curvature on the outside, again, by analogy. So we started to build this thing, so this is, this is um, uh, the frame, it's a rigid frame. And the columns connect with wide flange beams. 
And uh, you can see the welds, by the way, and this, this has to do with how things are put together and, and uh, decisions that we make. So we could grind it and we could polish it and we didn't do any of that stuff. So it's, it's and which also saves a little bit of money. You see that two and a half inch mark on the face of the pipe? You see that? So, um, So you see this right here and this right here. So this is this is a, a wide flange uh, beam, and this allows the beam in an earthquake to buckle or to collapse. So that's it. Really has nothing to do with this discussion. But anyway, the, the beam runs into the column. The column is inclined, as you see. The way we design this thing. I mean, this has to do not with a conception. So now we have a conception. It's, it's, it's an infinite pile of plans. And now we have a translation of that into a frame, horizontal lines and, and vertical lines. And now the implementation level of you have to dance through it discussion. So now the top flange and the bottom flange intersect with, with the pipe, with the column. And the theory of this was, uh, and there are drawings to hell on this, and, and the fabricators are a company called uh, Plastol, which theoretically are, are uh, among the best steel fabricators in, in Los Angeles. And there is supposed to be, so you know it's coming, there is supposed to be a plate in the column which takes the thrust of the top flange of the beam. Plate, plate. But the plate's not there. So the plate was off by this amount. And without that plate, and this is, uh, so we, we um, ran an ultrasound. And we had to do this and ran an ultrasound. Columns up, beams are up, run an ultrasound. Are the plates where the plates are supposed to be? Yes or no, check it. The answer is no. Now what do you do? OK, so the owner is yelling, the lawyer is yelling, the tenant is just all of this stuff for sure. So it's, if it's not dramatic, it's melodramatic. And somebody says, take the whole goddamn thing down and start over. And you did it, or you did it. You know? Somebody else says, cut the column open, torch out the plates, put in new plates. So what, what I did, this is, this is the, um, this looks simple enough. So this is the, the top flange, bottom flange, plate, plate. So that's the way it was supposed to be. And uh, this is what we got. Top flange, bottom flange, plate, plate. So you could run this as a part of your studio. How do you, how do you solve this? So this makes it, there is a kind of exhilaration, I guess, in a, in, a, in a strange way, which I could never account for, which is why I said initially, I'm not sure I can explain all of this. But this was a solution. And by the way, you can see all of these pieces. So it's not the Mendelssohn solution, where you dump everything into a sack and then plaster it. So what I decided to do, you can see here, so, so this is where, this is a for instance, it's all over the place. Every column is different. Almost every column is wrong by a few inches. So because the columns are as, as complex as they are, notwithstanding the shop drawings, and notwithstanding all of the digital tools to fabricate and to draw, they got all of this stuff wrong by a little bit. So for this column, this this plate was supposed to be here, this plate was supposed to be here. So what we did was to introduce these stiffeners between, between the flanges of the beam and then to extend this, to extend this. So you can see this now. As you walk in the building, you can see all of that. So you used to see this, now you see this. So, so I had to decide, is it okay? We missed this. This was the correction. So this was how it was corrected. Um, huh? Does everybody understand the correction? Okay. I guess yeah. I, what, yeah. What okay. So yeah, because now these plates. So oh. so what what's happened is that these plates extend oh, continuity they, they, they to this, oh, this to this, and this to this. I yeah. I knew that. I was just telling you. That. <laughs> So, it's better. 
Well, maybe. So we, we could talk about that. It's not consistent. Uh, that's one way to look at it. Um, and, and they're different. So this is, for instance, one. Uh, this is another one. This, this plate has to do with something else, but it's this. And so this is your solution? Yeah. And your engineer's solution? Well, we, we work with the engineer, but essentially take it down, cut it open, or find a way to do it which you can see. So I'm saying let's find a way to do it that we can see. This is the second one. I don't, I don't want to drag this out too much. But this, is, this was also we had an interesting debate with uh, Frank about the corners here, how to do the corners. It was he, when we came by and he could see the corners are sagging. The corners of, of the fins here, you can see this cantilever, but it's supported here and here. And then this, which is a cantilever supported on what? And what we did was we got a high strength double glazed piece of glass that's butted on the corner that goes in here. And we actually thought that in those cases the glass would pick up the steel. This is how the glass is put in in a typical case. So there are many, many of these pieces and they're put in with caulk like this. That's the typical piece of glass. So the whole thing is glazed all the way up to the roof. The roof has a deck. You can see the tape line, so that's where the glass goes in the corner. So this is the glass, this is the glass. This is a mitered corner right here. You see, this is a plate below uh, like this. So some of the plates come out straight. So this comes out here and then jumps over and does that. It's a complex uh, piece of glazing. <laughs> So it was sagging. So essentially what happened is that the engineer, so again, people, people talking to you about precision and rigor and engineering and the capacity. I mean, we have, to, at the end, it's not Eric, but it, it's somebody good, but smaller. And they missed it. So they thought the deflections would be substantially less. The deflections are substantially more. They thought the glass could carry that difference on the corners. Um, and it can't. So, so we're stuck with this, um, this problem, and the question was how to solve it. And what we're actually doing um, is, to, is to take a rod. This is the condition. So this is the corner, and this is the glass, and this is the miter corner. And we're going to put a rod in there, a quarter-inch rod, in the joint. What it does is it makes the joint where the two pieces butt on a miter, it makes it larger. So they're putting a rod in there, and the rod goes all the way up the building. So every corner has a rod. The rod is welded top and bottom. It's a quarter. So you have the rod. It's like a tension member going all the way up. Um, after a lot of analysis, and, and so we're starting to do that, I guess, next week. Uh, and that should work. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, the last thing I wanted, I wanted to talk about is, is um, I haven't ever talked about this before, but this book we're doing, which is, which is a big book, mostly on the, the uh, central LA and Culver City work. And it struck me that, that, that because I'm, I'm interested in history and what's history and if there's history, and, um, there's no history and there are only histories and we write history and history is a history we all of that and and labels of movements in time so what I decided to do was to take the process of working on these buildings in this area and associate that process in the book with stages in the history of Western civilization so that the first step is classical. Now this belongs to me. So I'm taking on the nomenclature that is conventionally assigned to historic periods and saying, this belongs to me, I'm classical, this is what I did. That's the first step. So th this, is, this is a longer story, but, but this, is, this, is the, this, is, this is the impetus to it. So there are projects, and I think what I'm saying is that, that there's, it's not so much a chronology, but there are steps and changes and changes in emphasis along the way. 
And this is an early step, so classical in the conventional sequence, I called it uh, classical. And there's, there's a little quote here just to give you an idea of a kind of equilibrium. And this comes from James Joyce who wrote a book called The Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, maybe some of you know it, but before that book was published, he wrote the same book called Stephen Hero, and which you can get, so that book is, and, and the lead character is somebody called Stephen Daedalus, and we know all about Daedalus, um, and, and then the maze, and so on and so on. But this, this has to do with a sense of the meaning of classicism, and I think an interesting comment here, the only legitimate process to move from one world to another. This is a conference room that we did a number of years ago, and it was installed, it's an executive conference room, which was installed in an old kiln, a kiln where they used to cook bricks, which is essentially a rectangle with a tipped roof. And the shape is actually a conical shape, but in an elliptical plan, which doesn't compute mathematically. It can't be resolved, but it doesn't have to be because it intersects the roof. Uh, and then I went back to, this is the medieval stage, and I used the Trevita project, uh, will use the Trevita project in, in this discussion as, as an example of a project not so much in equilibrium, but with very particular contradictions that seem to be reflective of, of what is generally assigned to be the Middle Ages, in addition to which a kind of naivete about the relationship of God and man and, and, and so on. Uh, and then the next one is uh, uh, the Renaissance which in this, in this context, I think has to do with, with, with a fundamental sense that the only chance you have to be objective is to be subjective. And that this building has to do with that movement. This, there is nothing in the building section which repeats itself. So the, the, the building section infinitely, a little bit like the plans uh, in the waffle, this, for every step, you know the line, you can't step into the same river. He said you can't step into the same river twice, but you can't even step into the same river once. And the building section is a little bit like that, that it, that it continues to move. And then the Baroque, where, where the, the, not only the lack of, of an a priori rule, but even the perversion of the sense of rule, even to the point in some discussions of grotesque, pushing this, this uh, uh, separation from, from a priori obligations. And then the last step is the modern age, um, which in this definition, I think this is a pretty good definition, is a perpetual definition, not so much a section of time with a form language that it's, that it's associated with, but a different sense that, that, that of the fragility of things and the responsibility of the architect or the artist to try to come to terms with what ultimately can't be, can't be resolved, can't be understood. And this is, this is another, another piece, this disenchantment of the world that it doesn't always work, and yet there's a certain joy and an enormous pleasure and energy and even satisfaction in beating that point by building. So the fact that you do it and you make it is an answer to it doesn't work and it doesn't add up. So in a personal way, it's not so much an intellectual response, but it's an emo and there it is. So you can say it's this or it's that or it means this. So the act of building is is a response to it can it, it it a response to the nihilism or the potential nihilism in the sense of modernism, dis dislocated, disconnected, and so on. 
So this is a book we, we're putting together now and hope to be uh, um, together so we can send it to the publishers at the end of the year. Joy to the world. So, uh, I'm about to turn it over to you guys for questions. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments. Uh, you have to formulate a question. You have four chances to have to pass the class. You are all committed at this point to pass the class. You have to have asked at least one question at some point or sometime in the, in the sessions. You have four chances. Get it over with now. I just want to make a few comments. Um, I thank my lucky stars. Eric decided not to be a theorist. Uh, I have quite a few friends that are architects that I thank my lucky stars. That, He's a damn good theorist. He's just, is this the book I'm supposed to write an essay for? Is yeah, this, you can, yeah. You is can. the one you, the December deadline and stuff? Yeah. Shit. So your essay's already better. You gotta make the, you know, yeah, for sure. I, I'm not kidding, your essay's already better in my, I like the, her, my essay is about Hermes, the god, you know, the messenger god, who's really interesting to me because I think of him as hermetic meaning it's very hard sometimes when you're engaging his work to understand what it's about. And I started wondering, how did the word hermetic, meaning hard to understand, come from the guy who's supposed to deliver messages? Yeah, so. Well, you haven't seen any of the messages. They're yeah. pretty inscrutable. <laughs> also, what I'm thinking about is I now understand why Brunelleschi burned all his drawings, uh, you know, because that's how you get sued. You know, when the drawings don't come in. <laughs> And I'm thinking the whole time that they're putting those bricks up, one guy's on you know, you know, this one's off about an inch, and the guy was like, well, just don't tell him. How bad can that be? <laughs> um, can you get, just quickly go back to the faulty pipe? Because I know this is an incredibly dumb question, and then I'm going to leave it alone. I, one more. All the way back to the very first place it's a fault. Huh? Okay. Now... Gap is okay. No, we're going to weld that. Okay. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean I don't want to be sitting here thinking the whole time, oh, everybody in this room thinks that gap's okay. And I'm no, no, no. <laughs> no, you had to put it together in pieces. That'll okay, be okay. Just so I, that was a question? Well, I just, I just want to make sure yeah. I'm not a complete idiot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. All right. I, um, I, I'm still think, here's some thoughts I had. I'm thinking, okay. Um, one thing is every myth of creation is a myth of uh, someone taking ideas, putting them into matter, and taking a long time to figure out how to do it. Whether it's the you know, just exactly what his first sentence was is, how do I make something? How do I how do I start a project where I don't, I'm not sure I know how to finish it, or how do I start something I don't know how to do? And but I know I. I think I know, I know I can figure out right, what I exactly. don't know enough to get to the end of the project, but not to sign up for it. That's right. And I think that is really taught to us as an ethos from an extremely early age in an incredible number of stories, and, you know, whether it's the Lego movie or the Three Little Pigs or the Bible. I mean, we are totally ingrained with that. I mean, in fact, I was thinking about it. If a woman wrote the Bible, it would go something like this. You know, God made everything, got, got to make man, made man, took 100 pounds of clay, made man, looked at him and said, ah, that kind of sucks. But I'm not starting over. I'll just take a piece of them and, because you don't want to start over. I fucked up when I used 100 pounds of clay. I'll just take a rib. Made woman, thought, ah, much better. I'll let her make the rest of them. You know, and, and so, <laughs> so it's usually not the first one that's any good. So, I mean, so there's a an ethos about this that's deeply embedded and it actually is in every aspect of our life and I really I think that's why the architect is always such a figure a metaphorical figure you'll hear it over and over and over a lawyer that doesn't know history um, is, you know, a, a lawyer that doesn't know history is something but a lawyer that knows history is an architect I mean, it's, you'll hear metaphors of it all the time so uh, and some questions I want to turn to Eric in a minute are um, Mostly, for example, friends of mine like Jesse and, and 
let's say, to, to a recent extent, you'll, you'll find it quite like Greg. These are, they get caught up in chasing new technologies. They get caught up in worrying that technologies are going to leave them behind, and so they feel responsible to chase new technologies. So some of the issues. But one thing I don't, like Eric said something really interesting. The Mendelssohn Project cheated. Uh, I, I take it that for you, Villa Savoie cheated. Not poured concrete, but concrete blocks stuck out over. But did Ronchamp cheat? No. I mean, I, I'm not, the Villa Savoie is different. Okay, but so, I mean, the issue is if you... And Ronchamp is again different. Yeah, so there are, each project has a different ethos. All three of these are projects in which the, the architect, the inside, the construction of the project, uh, is something piled up and then covered over. But piled up and covered over for three different reasons. In Mendelssohn's case, he couldn't do it. In Korb's case, he, in Villa Savoie, he couldn't do it, but for different reasons. Uh, it's not poured concrete, it's concrete blocks stuck it over. And in Ronchamp, it's the memory of old rubble. So it has symbolic reasons. Uh, in Villa, in, in, when you go to the Wexner Center, you, hit, you have empty columns. If you take someone like Wolf Pricks there and he knocks on those columns and they're empty, for him, and, and Eric was very careful to say, for me, it's not what I would do. And for Wolf, the idea that a column has no weight, or if you ever watch a TV series called Episodes, they're in a beautiful downtown mansion, I mean, beautiful Hollywood mansion or Bel Air mansion, and the maid is, you know, it's an ornate Rococo interior, and the maid is cleaning up, and there's these gigantic Corinthian columns made of marble. I don't know if you've ever seen it. And uh, she's dusting around, dusting around. She walks over to one of these gigantic marble Corinthian columns, puts her arms around it, moves it, because it's made of <laughs> plastic, dusts over it, dusts under it, and puts it back. And, of course, for Eisman, that's a perfect uh, instantiation of his theory of architecture. It's that architecture's not a about structure, it's about the sign of structure. So for each architect, the materialization of the reality is a different thing. That's a great work of architecture for Eisman. That would, that would be uh, apocalyptic failure for someone like Wolf and perhaps for Eric. And so these cases, you should not form, I don't think, any longer a standard ethos of what it means to construct. You construct the reality that you're working on. And I think that is what you saw but what you saw for Eric is not what has to be for you. What has to be for you comes out of your own work. And that's what we're going to talk about next week, or the next time we meet, which is how you construct a philosophy. It, what is the philosophy of architecture and how you construct your own? Um, so are there, uh, I'm going to start with a question to Eric, and then I'm going to move some, to some questions for you. I can talk to Eric. I mean, he, I, personally, I don't know how you feel, but I find Eric a thrilling, speaker and I love his work. I also love Eric because I keep thinking I catch him in a mistake and in fact just at the moment I think I catch him in a mistake. He details something and I've caught myself in a mistake. So right when he said Odysseus went for 10 years I thought ah he was wrong he went for 20 years and he said no nope. he went 10 years for war and then 10 years you know he, he broke the 10 years into two 10 specific years. So he's a really uniquely brilliant thinker, uh, do not think you have to read all these books that he reads. Uh, I didn't. Usually after a phone call conversation, he'll say something Why like, would you say that? I was going to say, it's At really least fun. leave it as an open possibility. No, no. I, I was going to say, you, sh you can read them. You know, go to movies, have a life is all he's teaching you. <laughs> yeah, I never managed <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but tell me about this issue about uh, like, it is important, for example, I think you say something really important is that when you do a work in relationship to the technology that makes, that will eventually make it easy to do, standard to do, is very important. So you have to anticipate the possibility of a project problem being solved, which means you have to anticipate the cusp of a, an emerging technology, which you did in, at the umbrella. Lots of the work that you did now that you did at a certain time and that others did at a certain times that would just seemed totally improbable are standard off-the-shelf technologies like the uh, double bit glass you know systems. What? So what do you do about that? I forgot to talk about this. Oh. 
That's what you do. Go ahead. What is it? Goddamn room with 20 people. Um, this is, this is um, a project we're building now. Um, which I and, named. Huh? Which I named. What was your name? The Bondage. <laughs> <laughs> That's your name. I'm starting um, to think I have a kind of a strange, perverse sexual part of my character that I never realized I have. <laughs> I don't think anybody's interested in that. You're okay. the, Fortunately, I'm making your students learn it, so it's not so no, legally you should be interested. <laughs> um, and we've been trying to build this building since 2099, 2000. This came out of that Wexner exhi yeah. exhibition. And um, we can't build it, literally. Um, the, the, the structural is so far. But I, that's, I think we're going to solve it. But the structural system for the building, it can't go through the building department in Los Angeles. This is at the corner of uh, Jefferson, really Jefferson and La Cienega. It's at the metro stop at Jefferson and La Cienega. And the city has a policy now of uh, allowing high density buildings, encouraging, if this is a policy in a planning sense, not really, but allowing bigger buildings. So it's about 250 feet high in an area where the buildings are mostly 45 feet and less. Um, and it's built into the subway stop. And so there, there are a lot of issues with it, but it looks like now we're getting it figured out. There's a contractor that's hired. We're supposed to break ground on it pretty soon. But where the hell is this other? <clears throat> the reason I, I put this in is we're talking a little bit about the logistics or the politics of working through um, how do you build a building which can't be approved by the Department of Building and Safety and where you have to hire at the owner's expense what they call a peer review group. Um, and the peer review group belongs to allegedly sophisticated, in this case a sophisticated steel engineer and builder, a structural engineer, an academic who is an engineer, a, special, a geotechnical specialist, and we're demonstrating to these characters the efficacy of, of uh, our solution, which turns out to be very, very odd <clears throat> in its premise, which is we understand this kind of building. We understand a rigid frame with columns and beams so everybody can see that. There are tables on it, there are studies on it, there are mock-ups on it, there are failures of it, there are earthquakes and so on and so on. And that's, that's in a sense, the pro forma to which a new conception has to, has to adhere or has to demonstrate Meaning, the new project doesn't make a case for its newness. It makes a case that, in fact, it's more or less likely to do what the old project did. So it's backwards. And this is the peer review. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So in other words, it's not so complicated as a theory, but the idea would be to make room for a different way of evaluating it. Some of this has to do with... with what is elastic in a structure, what is plastic in a structure, and the ranges, and the ranges that, that are tolerable in this elastic to plastic structure. And we're making a case, and I think, and maybe if we do this again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the case with you. But you sit in a room, you sit in a room with these guys, the steel guy, the academic guy, that's in the blue shirt, uh, Attila, um, uh, who runs uh, the local Arab office. And then there's a guy from LA Department of Building and Safety and three or four of my people. And all of these people sit in a room. And they're trying, and, and you know, there's 20 people in the room and there's 21 different theories. But the 22nd is, this is a pain in the neck. Please show us how this building is like a normal building. And, and of course, we're uh, reluctant uh, <clears throat> we're reluctant to do that. And then you get all the terms that you guys learn, you know, all this nonlinear uh, sort of... Um, this is actually, I mean, it, and, and, uh, part of a whole... This happens to be part of a rhino model, but, but a whole series... And, and I have to say, without Katia, it would be impossible to do this in a technical way. 
Although I had a question, Matt, some of you know Matt Construction, M-A-T-T, -T, so they're, they're building the thing, and the head guy from Matt was looking at one of these pieces we call the ribbons and asking me the other day if it had to be in the location. Remember I told you it's never where you draw it, and we were talking about to what extent it could be in a place that it's not supposed to be. But essentially what happens here, if you're interested in this, is the ribbons occur on the perimeter of the building in various configurations. And where they occur, there are then tubes. You can see the green. So the ribbons are the orange, the tube are the green. The tube ties the ribbons across, and the tubes then support. And there are a varying number of tubes. So none of this is consistent. It's different on every floor. And the tubes then support these wide flange girders, which are the blue, and then there are a series of trusses that run between those. And then there's a relationship between the core, the elevator core, and, and the frame of the building. We're going to build it. And, and I, think, I think we're pretty close now. But this is a process. It's not only in the small things I can say, OK, we'll sit there with a small engineering firm and myself and, and, and a contractor and figure it out. This has very different implications. Uh, because of its size and, and uh, I, I, it has 10 floors. All the floors are different dimensions. So there's a 13-6 floor, there's a 16-6 floor, there's a 24-foot floor. The 24-foot floor has mezzanines in it. So there are a variety of, of floor dimensions. It's unusual for a developer to produce a building like this. So we're, again, for the same reasons, but in a different context, a much more political context, a more complicated context. Although, oddly, I have to say, when the building is bigger, maybe, I mean, they come and talk to you in a year or so, maybe it's easier. Easier because if for no other reason than if you're spending $100 million instead of $10 million, there is more money around and more time and more patience. There are also very different kinds of pressures. There's a bank. Which, which, which produces a construction loan, and they want it done, and they want it done tomorrow, and they don't want to listen to these kinds of arguments. And then there is a client who has different motives, and then there's the, 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 the development of an internal construction logic for the building. So this is going to be an interesting one to see, to see if we can do it and see what it's going to take to do it. And well, why is the, the bank also wants to know what happens if they inherit it? What, That's absolutely sell? right. I die, the owner dies, everybody's killed in a plane crash. Now what the hell do we do with this? Right. Absolutely, they asked that. Absolutely. So why would the developer, why wouldn't, why wouldn't he say, look, uh, I don't want to wait for you to re figure this out. Can you just simplify it? Well, you just said yourself, different students read different things. Different developers have different priorities. Okay. But is there uh, so point? every developer won't do that, but you don't need every developer. Right. You just need one developer. And you've told me yourself at a certain point that, I mean, you, you are going to build it. You feel confident you can solve the problem. Yeah, I do. Is this the hardest one you've hit? I think, I think intrinsically the technical problems are the glazing. is it's, it's the steel and the glass that are the most difficult. It's not that intrinsically they're more or less difficult, but the size of it and so the pressures that are brought to bear, the sort of banking pressures and all that are very different. To the regulatory the insurance bank. goes up and you know all of, all of that kind of stuff. I wouldn't say that. I don't know if that's a good subject for you people to listen to because I'm not interested in creating any apprehensions on the part of anyone. I mean, I don't think everybody will do this, but people will do this. That's how architecture keeps moving. I don't want people to be hiding behind doors because of lawyers. Um, uh, and that's just part of the but world. Is, that's part of the it is. winning. It is. So there is somebody sitting in, 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 in a boardroom in a bank saying, why are we screwing around with this thing? Just build a, you know, because the location is great. This is uh, uh, Dr. Dre just moved in over there. There's right. all kinds. So it's a sort of she she area that didn't used to be. Um, uh, so it's a good venue for the building. It's next to the train. So all of that makes sense. That's why they support it. Yeah, developers are as good at. They're you know argue, they know what they're doing. Right? He's not this, he's not idiot or she's not idiot. They're they're it's a risk, but I think whoever's doing this feels like they're going to make some money on it. 
They do. And the bank feels that way too, or they wouldn't be screwing around. Right. So, okay. So we have to figure it out. Questions? Yep. Uh, studying in school and many employees spending the most of the time or all the time for visa, but particularly me, I feel like least secure in that area of question. How do I put it something that I make on my computer or desk into the world? Yeah. Well, we're working right now on giving each student $30 million to build a building before they graduate. Uh, but tuition's going to go up. <laughs> I don't know. I, it, it's an incredibly, you know, uh, if you're a surgeon, do you watch the Nick? Uh, you, it's fantastic. Uh, more TV, less books. That's my current formula. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you, you dissect, I'm sorry guys, it's just, you, know. um, you dissect a whole lot of pigs, then you dissect a whole lot of cadavers, and then you kill a whole lot of patients. Uh, unfortunately for you, you don't have to kill a whole lot of patients. I really don't know how you do it. Like you, at the educational level... Yeah, but what's your name? Kirillin. Kirillin? Kirillin. Like Cyril. Oh, okay, Kirill. I mean, I'm going to answer you the question like, what, what, what I know is this. Uh, generally, you know things are going around well when people are accumulating a lot of stories and myths and wanting to put it, put the evidence of that, like stories about these kinds of stuff you're seeing, and then put the evidence of their of their fascination with it somewhere in their project as part of the final review. So we require it sometimes a detail or a description or, you know, we require it and it shows up as the end of an assignment or as a burden, a burden or as you're meeting a requirement. What we don't see, you know, and it's not disappointing for us to see uh, anti-gravity fantasies or billion or trillion dollar projects. These are not failures. What they are failures is, is for the, an ethos of the mythology to take hold and fascinate you. Mm -hmm. So if you started to accumulate these stories at an early age and start really watching the field for that, if you look at Wolf Prix's very famous largest cantilever in the world, which I, I don't find interesting at all, and I think, you know, because I'm not interested in cantilevers anymore, but he loves, and you see Andy Zago's lecture of, Web, web, uh, Photoshop cantilevers. Have you ever seen this? The long, you can go on a Photoshop and there's cantilevers a half mile long and stuff like that. Wolf Pricks loves cantilevers and he decided in his life to make the world's largest cantilevers and he made the world's largest cantilever and it's in, and it's in Korea and they freaked out so much they made him build a column in case the storm came. The col against every possible calculation, it will never be needed so the column goes down but just so that the bank would build it, the column comes up if a storm comes. It'll never need to come up. And, you know, so, but anybody that is in the world that knows this stuff knows that story, loves that story. And so anybody that's got an unlikely column cantilever in their project is going to have the bank, bank column. So as, as soon as we can get projects that have that built into their storytelling, then I know it's okay at the school level because there's never going to be anything like a real realism. It just doesn't happen with the urgency in the sense of, it's a bit like being a five-year-old and being a 13-year-old having a first date and then you know where I'm going with this. You know, There's a, a moment where reality really sets in and there's a whole lot of getting ready for that reality. 
and the whole lot of getting ready for reality shows its evidence. And we're not getting that to happen, and it's, it's our fault. It's not, it's not even a fault. You know, it's, it has to do with the, it's the thrilling quality of the production at a one-to-one -one scale that you're doing, and the failure for us to get you excited about the scale problem. You know, it, it's funny. I wouldn't explain that. The, the cantilever discussion for me, it, it, Wolf is a, is a close friend of mine. It seems, the way you explain it, it seems silly to me. And I, I don't think that really explains. In other words, if you can do it and it's been done, and it's been done over and over, then the technical capacity to do that is really very much a question of engineering. I mean, there's, Niemeyer did one, you know, that library oh, yeah. in, you know, um, uh, in Brasilia. So there, there has to be, maybe it has to do with wonder, you know? But do you find if you, it? If you stand there wonder? in Brooklyn and you look at the bridge or you look at the Golden yeah. Gate Bridge or you look at that wacko thing, and is it in Dubai or Abu Dhabi? I went to see this ATK tower, which doesn't seem to mean much of anything, anything, except it's like, God, look what we can do, you know? And, and there, is, there is something in contradiction to all of the things we can't do. Like, I can do this. You know, it's like years ago when you go down the Sunset Strip in a different way, and somebody would paint their build the disco red. And everything else was puce or beige. <laughs> but then every son of a bitch on the street painted it red. Right? The whole sunset strip was red. And so I don't know whether where the cantilever ends. Maybe if it starts to bend, yeah. or it starts to curve, or it, you know, in other words, it, it seems like you need to ask something of it more than just dimension. But you said that's absolutely right, and there's no reason to believe that what was a source of incredible wonderment continues to... Be. I opened a film on Frank with uh, the slave walking in, seeing the Colosseum, and saying, because he'd never been to Rome before, I had no idea man could do such things. And the director clearly uses that because later on the slave rises above himself, fights a war, and sets himself free. So he's foreshadowing. He sees the Colosseum, says, I had no idea man could do, do such things, and then he does the same thing for himself. That's, that sense of wonderment is absolutely crucial. But it's you also. It's funny, I mean, I, in, in those terms, and I can remember the time, probably before most of you in the room were here, and somebody would stand up and give a lecture at SciArc, and, and I can remember this for myself, going to somewhere in Montreal and giving a lecture. And, Walking out, and people say, God, that's he's nuts. There, there, and 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 listening to that, which is not necessarily a compliment. It might be for some, it might be pejorative for others. I don't think there's a lot of that. I mean, there are a number of interesting characters that come to Sire and exhibit and speak and so on. And 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 the students sit in the audience, and I don't think you can put up something. You'd have to try pretty hard now to. To, to produce that kind of wonder or surprise, I think the context is different. So at least in terms of, you know, whatever I can, right. whatever drives it or whatever makes something good different from something else which is less good. But the wonder quotient, you know, which I, I think is, is, still, is still in me, I don't find that shared so much in a student audience now, whether you guys are jaundiced or tired or bored, I don't think it affects the work so much, but it's response to other work. It's not as exhilarating, it's not as astonishing, and maybe I'm wrong, just in talking to people, and I think that applies to the faculty too. I don't, it's, it's not quite being exhausted but uh, the energy quotient, I think, is, is a well, little bit different. Yeah, maybe I think they move through interest a lot, but don't hit peaks of wonder as much. Any, any more questions? I got some, one more homework assignment for you, and then I actually have to go take a shower, shave, and actually look like a human being. <laughs> um, any questions? More good for you? You've, you've passed. Yeah. Karen, I know you're not yet. Yes. Uh, 
Jim. So like, we're gonna have all this new technology for us to 3D print, 3D print clear material. I mean, since you guys are trying to instill this kind of wonder for tectonics, do you think this sort of introduction of these technologies would probably hinder our kind of wonder for tectonics since it's so easy to like, just, you know, make a form and have it be printed? You know, when, when I started here about 10, 12 years ago, for all the talk of digital tools, school didn't have a thing. Not one 3D printer, not one CNC machine, not one laser cutter, not one bag of machine, nothing, zero. And, and I think it's, it's not so much the wonder of the tools, it's the wonder of the people working the tools. And even though that may be the obvious thing to say, it's, it's nonetheless important. What is a tool designed to do? What is a software designed to do? What are the origins of the software? And I think part of it goes back to the cantilever discussion. What can you ask of it that its inventors didn't anticipate you might ask? And what, in addition, will that require of you in terms of drawing or fabricating all of that? I don't, I, I think that, that I was making an argument that it's interesting and, and compelling to me to go where the tools haven't been. I also said Katia was very helpful, so I wouldn't say it's entirely one way or the other. So that to imagine a project where you don't have the robot to do it, or to imagine the Stobly stuff used in a way which is antithetical, and I think we've already done this. When, when we first started with a robot, I had a student, and we, were, we had the robot sketching. Robot was sketching, and we made a project with the robot sketching, and we made a, pro, a project where the, ro, where the robot was changing what it was doing, as opposed to a typical robotic argument assembly line. You put on the tires, I'll put in the crankshaft, you put in the windows, I'll put in the roof, car goes out the other end. So that, you know, you, you, you put in the wheels and you put in the crankshaft, and out the other end comes the Trojan horse or something. You know, in other words, what you originate and how, they, how that process, I mean, this is just an interesting way to think about the process of, of robotics. We didn't buy the robots to ratify the fact that if you have robots, that makes a school cool or an unusual place. The tool doesn't make it an unusual place, even though the tool is, is, is important and even essential. It's the intellectual approach or the idea of what the tool is designed to do, what could it do that it wasn't designed to do, where is it inadequate that would require a different tool. That's where the magic comes from. Can I... Uh add a comment to that question and before I bring it to an end. I've written about this. It's a really interesting piece of technological history. Virtually every new tool that's made is to solve a problem in an existing practice and an existing discipline. Saxophone was made for an orchestra. Uh, electric guitar was made for jazz so that jazz, play, jazz guitar could be heard in a bigger band. CAD, uh, tubed painting, uh, word processors, these were all made to solve problems for existing practices. They it almost, in, not almost, in every case, they didn't solve that problem. They didn't enter into the world eventually as having that proper property. What they did was give birth to new practices and produced new forms of geniuses. So the saxophone was invented in France for the orchestra, spent a little time as a marching instrument in Germany, and then finally became an amazing instrument as the voice of jazz for black jazz in America. And this goes on with electric guitar, this goes on with painting, with acrylic paint, change painting in particular. I mean, so every time a new technology develops, it doesn't actually solve the problem it was developed for, it gives birth to new forms of genius and the exact, so. But somebody has to see that. Somebody right. has to see it as an opportunity, not just to that's solve right. a, you know. So, so you somebody just, invented a hammer and you use it to school. put screws in. Or, 
in my in a personal experience of mine, Greg Lynn three times has gone involved in technology. I thought he was an idiot when he bought animation software. I was wrong. I thought he was an idiot when he got involved in robotics. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that one. Uh, and I thought he was an idiot when he got involved in sailboats and carbon, carbon fiber, and now I'm 100% sure I'm wrong about that one. It is a fa fantastic project that's going to transform architecture. So go, just go with the odds. And your homework for the next week, I mean, I want you to watch uh, Secrets of the, uh, the Great Cathedral on Nova. That was for this week. For our next session, October 20th, I want you to watch another Nova. It's called Rise of the Hackers. And this is about a person developing a personal philosophy. I want you to understand the complete transformation of the world, the end of nations, the new role of design and architects in the world. And I want you to pay particular attention to a thing called Stuxnet, S-T-U-X-N-E-T. So watch Rise of the Hackers, that's your homework, and we will see you October 20th. Jeff, you should see Tim's Vermeer. Tim's what? Vermeer, have you seen him? No, is it a movie? Tim's Vermeer. Yeah, which is about this guy who basically goes after people trying to break into the Vermeer Institute. Mm -hmm. And he's basically going after people who are trying to break into the Vermeer Institute. Okay, yes, and, and, and Tim's Vermeer. <laughs> now you have more homework, really? and you can talk her into not coming and you'll have less homework. See you. It was fantastic. Thank you all for coming. I'm really sorry for taking you away. No problem.